Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. Today, we're gonna to be heading to Watch Mojo. Now, if you don't know the channel watchmojo.com, it is a very mainstream channel that likes to do tier lists. And every once in a while, they go into a historical list. And this one is their top 20 worst decisions in history. Now, that's a big thing to try to tackle here. And although they're not an historical channel, I think it is really important to check out things like this because mainstream audiences watch this kind of stuff and then make interpretations and, you know, base that in their knowledge about history. So I think it's pretty important that historians, teachers, you know, those kind of people that have maybe a little more background on it can see this stuff because we've got a better interpretation of what kind of mainstream public thinks about history. And maybe as educators like myself, it's useful to see that to make sure things are straight. And of course, not to let more important things slip by the least important things. Nevertheless, we're going to check this out. The original video is going to be down below if you want to check that out first. But don't forget to come on back over here. As always, let me know down in the comments um, what you think of this list and, you know, what kind of changes or anything you would make. All right, let's get started. All right, 20 decisions is pretty ambitious for them to go after. It's an 18 minute video. This could be a long one for me, depending on how much I need to talk about. But I also want to hear from you again. Make sure you comment down below. All right, here we go. They didn't know this beach was deserted. What else don't they know? Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today I see we're thin counting down our picks uh, for the top 20 red line. worst decisions in history. The call up of reservists. Necessary, he says, to stop the West dividing Wait, they really do like his country. For this invasion list, of we're looking at historical Ukraine by Russia. Slapping our foreheads in retrospect. To be clear, most of these are military or diplomatic decisions. We right. also won't be including entertainment decisions or things people didn't do because there's no limit to those. Sure. If I mean, if, if they're not all the big mistakes in history are military, I could see if maybe if they titled them, we're trying to do like top 20 worst, like military decisions. That's not really, you know, the driver of the, the full driver of history, political, social changes. Those are massive. Anyways, there's that's my a perspective. Historical mistake. You feel we got to put it all together. For excluding help us rectify things in the comments. Okay. Number 20, the Bay of Pigs. Um, you guys should save me time on it. Go through the comments on this video and see if all the history nerds have chimed in. All right, Bay of Pigs invasion. Okay, take Americans trying to take out Castro. Worst decisions, like, uh, all Vision. right. Let's As the see. sun rises, there is a surprise attack from Castro's Air Force. The B-26s are shot down. In April 1961, what they say the about United it. States of America aided anti-Castro Cuban exiles in an invasion of their former country. It was a complete disaster. The Cubans knew they it was. were coming, thanks to some loose lips by the exiles. And yeah. the CIA knew they knew, yet failed to inform President John F. Kennedy. Kennedy could see all sorts Miscommunication, of man. There that can no drive every bad decision. That we could take Cuba over in a week. Furthermore, the original invasion plan, which had been drafted under President Dwight D. Eisenhower, yeah. called for U.S. air and naval support, which... Right, yeah, I remember that now. Um, you know, yeah, when, when Kennedy comes in, he, in the... Well, 1960 election then picks up in 61. It was like already there. And so he had this information. And from his standpoint, um, because again, he and and Nixon, you know, both running in 1960, they were both and just the United States in general. Everyone was anti-Russia, anti-communism. Like that was not a party difference. Didn't matter, you know, because they both. Yeah, yeah, everyone kind of felt the same way. But yeah, comes across his table early on when he comes president. And, you know, from what he hears from his CIA, which he's got to trust, especially and you, you would as a new president, see that, you know, Eisenhower had been planning this. And the United States have been trying to mess with Cuba for a long time because of the uh, Cuban Revolution and stuff like or the yeah the communist revolution, Cuban um, revolution there to take out uh, Batista and put in a communist regime. But like. Yeah, he thought, you know, it was all good. So, I mean, it's hard to kind of blame him for that, I guess. But um, I don't know how you could trust the CIA and all that stuff after that if you were a president. But Kennedy yeah. withheld after a certain point. The debacle only served to solidify Fidel Castro's rule. It while did. Also showing communist leaders worldwide that the U.S. could be defeated. The enemy was confused. He had thought that our defense... It hurt the American the image first big time. He did not expect all the Cuban people to rise against him. Oh, and it made possible the whole Cuban Missile Crisis thing. And that's Number later, 19. Though. Yes, and that's later. So, um, yeah, it definitely bolstered Castro. Castro had just kind of, you know, only recently they'd... It, it, 
he had, well, he, he, he personally had come to um, kind of be the power in Cuba. But anyway, so what, what actually happens there is they do this invasion, right? So the CIA's thing was, and, and really a lot of a policy for regime changes for the Americans is not necessarily to use, to try not to use the full might of the military, but like train people, right? Train people, especially locals in whatever Latin American country, because that happened all over the place. United States had their hands in any type of regime change that might see a, a socialist or communist um, regime come into play. But anyway, so yeah, the, they're trying to uh, uh, train Cubans, right? And they bring them over and they do this invasion on this, the Bay of Pigs on the beach there. And like they said, Castro knew about it and they're easily just able to like capture all the guys. Uh, they actually end up ransoming them back to the United States. I forget the exact number on that, like a billions of dollars to like get those guys back. And it absolutely made uh, Castro a hero and, and secured his leadership. He became a hero in the communist world because of it. Anyway, we're, we're only one down. All right, Donner Party, okay. This is gross if you don't shortcut. know about it. Snowstorms trap the wagon. But it's not a military thing, though. It's not military. For the, winter. the result was extreme suffering and starvation. One of the most infamous pioneering groups in American history, the Donner Party consisted of 87 settlers who set out for California in the 1840s. By the time they reached their destination, only 48 remained, thanks to a multitude of costly errors. Yeah. They set out too late in the season, leading to unfavorable yeah, the weather one. throughout the journey. They were undersupplied and- Does it make sense? You wanna be through the the part of your trek and this is something you had to carefully plan for western expansion migration and stuff you had to carefully plan stuff and know and geographic knowledge was still kind of limited people were using different routes across the rockies and stuff like that but the big thing is you have to be able to know that you're going to have enough time to get through the mountains before um you hit winter otherwise you know as you can imagine it can be tragedy and accepted more members as they went leading to further shortages that's they hard yeah guide and can't have too big a of a group that was untested there was infighting and even murder within the party and when the group was stranded by a blizzard in the sierra nevada mountains mm -hmm. some were forced oh yeah to yeah sierra to not they cleared they were already in california the donner party did everything wrong some people came through it heroically and some of the people in that party were far from heroes and they got worse as the, as the conditions got worse number 18 churchill decides yeah. to invade i mean i guess that was a bad decision i mean it, did it have like for me like for worse decisions stuff like they're saying i think there's got to be like a historical impact like the bay of pigs yeah it had minor minor effect but like just some dudes that made a bad decision and died like with no impact i don't know i, I just don't think they should rank up very high all right churchill decides to invade gallipoli this does turn out very bad. Aid Gallipoli. Has World it been War a one. success or hasn't it? Well, it's hard to say, sir. During the First World War, fighting had stalemated in Europe, and Russia was engaged with the Ottoman Empire in the Caucasus. Seeking to divert Central Powers forces from Europe and cut off the Ottomans, the Allies, with Winston well, Churchill spearheading it, yeah. decided to attack present-day Turkey. To reinforce naval forces, the Gallipoli Peninsula was invaded. The campaign was a colossal failure. The Allies drastically underestimated the Ottoman forces and used inexperienced troops and commanders, resulting in a 10-month-long engagement with over half a million men killed or wounded. Um, something interesting about that, too, is a big uh, um, um, portion of the of the force, the, the naval force and land force that's going in through Gallip to Gallipoli or through Gallipoli um, was also, uh, they were um, Australians, a lot of New Zealanders as part of the Commonwealth of British empire. Uh, the British were heavily known for recruiting and, and enlisting um, their uh, peoples of their colonies. And that was a big feature of world war one. Cause that's what this was. So uh, that's why imperialism is such an important part of World War One, as all the countries tried to do that and, and, and script their their colonial people. The Allies were forced to retreat, with Britain's reputation suffering heavily over the, the Mel Gibson movie Churchill about this. Losing his job. At least Turkey and the Allied New Zealand an and Australian. Australia gained some national pride over their roles. Yeah, they did. They consider those people heroes in um, Australia. Yep, there's a young Mel Gibson. I've actually never seen that one though. Battle. Yeah, so a little more context. I they they missed a big part, or you know, whatever. I get it. There's there's time. You can't hit everything about why this this was happening. So Winston Churchill was um, uh, um, 
leader of the the uh, the Navy kind of within the government. He's the one that, from the government perspective, give down orders and stuff like that. So this is a, a young, a much younger Churchill. Anyway, so the big problem was Russia, who, of course, was an ally of the Western allies uh, like Britain, France, etc., were uh, disconnected from Russia. And uh, what we mean by that is going north of Europe was very much dominated and was very uh, controlled by the Germans, very hard to safely get through stuff. So the idea was to try to make to secure a passage from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. So because um, there you can you could pass through there, right? Nearest point is there around the Dardanelles, so up through uh, um, uh, uh, Istanbul, et cetera. And so they were trying to control that passageway so then they could hook up with the Russians and be able to, you know, help them on that side. So, you know, famously, uh, the young Churchill is going to order this invasion and it was it did not do well, like they said, for a lot of reasons there. And it they never get that passage. It actually ruins uh, Churchill's career for a while. He basically gets fired, has to kind of come back through the ranks again. He actually joins the uh, army and starts fighting and um Anyways, it uh, definitely derailed his career. He's he's pretty fortunate actually that he kind of um, like recovered from that. Anyway, okay, battle little bighorn mm -hmm. of the little bighorn. This is part of yeah, was always on the move. removing Native the Americans from lands the during Army to a Western village. expansion. Was an impossible task. Also known as Custer's Last Stand, the Battle of the Little Bighorn is one that General has been romanticized in the folklore of the United States. However, General George Armstrong Custer's numerous mistakes have left its legacy far more muddled. In 1876, Custer met his end when attacking a force of Allied Plains Native Americans near the Little Bighorn River in Montana. The dominated. Custer was outnumbered and had split his forces into several smaller groups, and the Native Americans had superior rifles. He realizes he doesn't have enough troops to do the job. He sends a rider south with a note calling for more men and more ammo. Custer had rejected not only reinforcements, but also several Gatling guns, which may have turned the tide of battle. Yeah, Gatling gun is like the best, it's, it's the best um, weapon of the time period around turn of the century. Like it's by far the best. You want one of those, but yeah, underestimating. And like they were saying too, um, this is a time too where so many Native Americans, of course, were constantly uh, those groups having to defend themselves. So they they know that you've got to get the better weaponry. So they're good on horseback. They're good on uh, yeah, getting weapons and stuff like that. They're be easy to underestimate, but really stupid too. Decision to attack before the rest of the army arrived resulted in Custer's death and the deaths of around half of his men. Lieutenant Colonel George Custer and over 200 of his men annihilated in a defeat that devastated America in 1876. Number 16, yeah. Napoleon's invasion I don't think there's any more to say Russia. about that. Yep. This is interesting. I thought this would be up higher. I mean, didn't you? I mean, I don't know if it's for the memes or whatever, but like this was also extremely impactful for the future of Napoleon's ambitions, this invasion of Russia. Anyway, we'll let them tell the story. But yeah, I, I would actually, if I was making my own list of just stuff coming out of my mind, I think this would have been higher. The little corporal's grand army of 680,000 soldiers time, time. strolled into Russia hoping for a quick and easy defeat, only to find the Russian forces to be constantly retreating. Using what's known as a scorched earth tactic, the mm. Russians would burn down villages so that the pursuing French army would have no supplies to feed their vast numbers. Yeah, one of the things I, I feel like when people are trying to attack Russia is the under the biggest one of the biggest things I underestimate is not just like the winter and the cold, because that's true, but like how freaking big Russia is, especially if you're trying to take over someone like Moscow, which is not near the western border. Eventually, winter came and the French forces were subject to starvation, hypothermia and eventually defeat. It was a harsh lesson, but one that every military leader has since taken to heart. Never underestimate the environmental factors when fighting on enemy soil. Number 15. They say what we're all saying. Hitler and the Nazis <laughs> literally repeated it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, they, they apparently got the next chapter in history where someone else did that and failed and long term failed because of it. Don't invade Russia. Okay. Especially not in the winter. Okay. Unless you're the Mongols. <laughs> All right, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So I am seeing a lot of um, more modern history stuff. I mean, everything. Have they had anything before the 1800s? Not really. But 
Um, yeah, I think this is understudied a lot, um, especially in terms of um, things that led to the fall of the Soviet Union. I think this gets overlooked quite a bit. So if you haven't heard about Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, let's see what they got. But uh, it'd be interesting, you know, something to look into more. 15, the Soviet invasion I'm sure I've covered it probably multiple times now on my time channel. the Russians, or in this case, the Soviets, to take a beating, as the 1979 invasion of this Middle Eastern country was decidedly not a win for Afghanistan does not consider themselves the Middle East, FYI. For them. Wanting to protect communist interests in the country, the Soviets sent over 100,000 soldiers after the assassination of the president of the Afghanistan Communist Party. However, due to the alien... So similar to like the United States and Cold War era, you know, the United States and Soviet Union always wanted leaders of countries to be sympathetic, maybe not necessarily have to be full allies, but at least be like a working partner. And you see that with the U.S. all over the place, right? And then, yeah, there were instances of the Soviet Union doing the same things, invoking their military to try to preserve, preserve a regime or prevent a regime, ch regime change or create a regime change nature of the communist way of life an afghani and muslim resistance rose up with monetary aid from a certain western capitalist arch enemy of the Soviets. united states the ensuing conflict would result in the death of almost 15,000 soviet soldiers a soviet withdrawal and a continued civil war in the country so that's another instance by the way of the cia putting money and weapons and training into an enemy of an enemy proxy wars right um so you do see this and it does actually work but, man, and I could go on for this. I have videos that cover this, too. But um, the same guys that the United States were supporting, uh, Mujahideen, freedom fighters against the, the communists, are also going to be the same people that afterwards um, also create groups like Al-Qaeda and look to preserve is Islamic traditions and Islamic life in other parts of the world, which will then bring the United States and some of these you know, former uh, um, people that fought against the Russians there against each other with terror attacks, 9-11, Osama bin Laden, all that stuff. It's interestingly all connected. If you don't know the connection, I don't want to go into it here because it's a long video. Definitely look uh, into the effects of the United States supporting the uh, um, anti-communists in, uh, in the Afghani war there. Number 14, the Spanish Armada's failed invasion of England. <laughs> it's another place you don't invade, unless you're Vikings, I guess. Spanish army safely to England. We're finally getting earlier now. In the face now. of a very strong and active English Navy. The summer of 1588 saw the formation of a Spanish Armada, which set sail for England in an attempt to overthrow Elizabeth I Who's gonna to dominate restore the Catholicism seas. to the nation. However, the Spanish and Portuguese vessels were engaged in the English Channel by an English and Dutch Armada. Although the Spanish Armada had Drake? larger ships and more men, the defenders had more ships that were more maneuverable and better armed. The Spanish were defeated, forcing a retreat. Not only did they fail to restore Catholics to power in England, but their failure arguably emboldened Protestants across Europe and True. led to the decline of Spain as an international yeah. power. That Spain absolutely dominated global traffic and colonization in the 1500s. That was really their, their century. The 1500s was like the century for the Spanish. And yeah, it did. That, this this kind of marked the beginning of the end of that you know, top Top dog ranking. Now Drake had proved that the English had dancing. Guys dancing. Was superior to anything that the Spanish or anyone else. It's kind of hard to hear there, this say. guy. Number 13, the Fourth Crusade. <laughs> Pope Innocent III called for the retaking Epic of fail. Jerusalem by Christians. The holy city was then Muslim controlled, and the plan was to attack the Ayyubid Sultanate in Egypt, <laughs> the largest Muslim empire at the time. However, a series of blunders led to the Crusaders doing nearly the opposite of their stated now. goal. When not enough Crusaders embarked from Venice, the army that arrived there could not pay for passage. Furthermore, these same Crusaders sacked Zara, a Catholic city, under Venice's instruction to recoup their investment. <laughs> the Pope excommunicated them. Then, these Crusaders retook the Orthodox Christian-controlled Constantinople for Alexios IV, who promised them support in retaking Jerusalem. Never paid However, him. they sacked the city when he was deposed. Yeah, well, the Fourth Crusade get their money. only served to weaken Christian-controlled Byzantium. Number that 12. It. Yeah, that was it. That was the beginning of the end. So the Fourth Crusade is considered the last of the major Crusades. They don't even get to the Holy Land. By this time, you know, Crusades have had this lore of people that went on the Crusades. Well, if you're sticking with the lore of the First Crusade, but you're coming back home with land and wealth and you're a hero and all this stuff. And people in the First Crusade were definitely, I think, more motivated 
for religious means than those that embarked in the later crusades because of the success of the first crusade, other crusaders come in later ones, but less, but with less of religious ideas and more about power, glory, land, all that stuff. By the time the fourth crusade there, you're, you're basically dealing with mercenaries and those guys want their money. And as you saw there, when they didn't get their money, when they got to Constantinople, um, they just sacked the city, killed tons of stuff, looted things. Um, this by the way, will be one of the biggest daggers in the Byzantine Empire, because they never really recover from this. And um, also, it's pretty much the end of the Crusades of any thought of the Christian West coming in and taking over the areas in and around Jerusalem basically died with it. So I think that is very worthy of being on a list. All right, Chernobyl. I am very, very much into Chernobyl and the whole story. I've been into it for a long time. Um, it is it is pretty epic. Um, another thing that we can put in the line of things that hurt the Soviet Union's prestige and everything and um, will, you know, be one of one of the causes towards the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. So this is an 86. Um, so you are getting to the latter years of the Soviet Union. For noble meltdown. Comrade Dyatlov, I apologize. But what I love that I show. I know it's the there's some no. inaccuracies. I won't do it. It isn't safe. The Chernobyl nuclear disaster is arguably Watch the that show worst many nuclear times. incident the HBO show. that wasn't intentional. On April 26, 1986, the number four reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant exploded during a safety test. While the disaster was partly the result of failures in Soviet safety procedures and the design part. of the reactor itself, operator error also played a major factor. Extreme conditions were created due to the negligence of those in charge. Additionally, the test was conducted by the less experienced night shift at the plant right. instead of the day shift. The they had to they had to rush it. They were trying to rush it. They had been delayed on this. And in the Soviet Union, you have deadlines you have to keep and stuff like that for all these people. And if you don't meet those deadlines, there's harsh repercussions. So they they forced it. They really did. End result was an unprecedented catastrophe that had it not been contained, could have poisoned most of Eastern Europe. Yep. At long last we have I mean, arrived. It, did. It, it could have made like Eastern Europe inhabitable if they had not, you know, contained it the way that they did but at the cost of incredible amount of lives that the Soviet Union denied. One twenty-three forty-five. That's another explosion. Boom. Number 11, Moctezuma II welcomes the Spanish. Mm, okay. Obviously a, a world changing event. But yeah, welcoming them in the idea of welcoming them in. I don't think you can put everything on that. Especially because disease is what killed the, the Aztecs, 90% of the Aztecs die from disease, um, not just the military intervention here. Although that would be, you know, the second most uh, responsible thing for the fall of them. But even that was because the Spanish recruited um, uh, locals that, that hated the Aztecs to fight for them when there were only a few hundred uh, Spaniards there. The Empire, the, Span uh, the Aztec Empire probably had 30 million people in it. Moctezuma Xocoyotzin also known as Montezuma, was the emperor of the, the Aztec second. Empire in present-day Mexico. In 1519, Hernán Cortés, a Spanish conquistador, set about invading Moctezuma's empire. What does Hernán Cortés find? A very Hernan well planned city with an entire government structure. A city we know in its time was one of the largest in the world. Cortés may have started... Uh, probably up to a quarter million people there. City on the lake, all that stuff. By the way, where I want an Assassin's Creed game is right in the setting. Either be a Spaniard or a local Aztec or something like that. Uh, explore the city, get involved in the politics of it. I saw some other company is making some, like a game just like that. I forgot what they are to kind of compete with Assassin's Creed and it looks crappy and I'm so sad about that because I think that will then keep Ubisoft from making one in this setting. If there's already a game like it that attempted it and will probably fail. ...with only 500 or so conquistadors, but by allying with local people discontent with Moctezuma's rule, those numbers Tens swelled. of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand allies. Moctezuma allies. invited Cortes into his capital, Tenochtitlan, after he claimed to be a royal representative. This proved unwise, however. Records Cortes are very shoddy Moctezuma on this, everybody. Captive. And... Records are very disputable on this because the records are all from the Spanish perspective. We know Cortes lied about a ton of stuff. Um about this. We got to take most of the interactions between in the Aztecs and the Spanish with a grain of salt. We really do. 
By welcoming Cortes, Moctezuma had effectively spelled the beginning of the end for his empire. Lands were divided. Hardly nothing and left. With the same stones and the same hands of the native people, they built a new city. Number 10, Mao's Great Leap Forward. Yes. Murdering millions of your yes. own people is always a bad idea. But that's just what Good happened event to put in China on. during the early to mid 20th century. In an attempt to rapidly industrialize the nation, the communist leaders tried to institute a demand for crops that the people could not meet. The resulting famine caused yep. deaths around the country. However, Tens of millions, famine probably. was not the only cause of death during the Great Leap. Many reports of torture, beatings, and suicides have surfaced throughout the years. An exact death toll is nigh impossible to nail Rushev down, on the but left. it's been estimated at anywhere between 23 and 55 million people and no amount of progress is worth such a steep cost. Number nine. Oh, I want to talk so much about all these. They're all like major world events there. So um, yeah, the <coughs> China want to industrialize. And one thing they have going for them wasn't industry, it was agriculture. They have a huge population, right? So um, the problem, you know, with some of that too was also the fact that uh, they would sell a lot of that grain because they needed money to industrialize, right? So selling, you know, some of that grain, which, you know, becomes problematic because then you can't feed your people, right? So if you're selling, it's like the Soviet Union, for example. Um, and then, yeah, try to use that money that industrialized. That was, that was very dangerous. Now, there are, it is much more complicated than that. Every time I bring it up in discussion groups online or something like that, people always want to throw in that there's a lot of other things to go on with the Great Leap Forward. And that's, you know, that's going to be true. Um, but yeah, they tried to make a superhuman effort that failed and ended up killing their own people. The toppling of Mohammad Mossadegh okay. in Iran. Okay. Once again, we travel to the Middle East. But this is pretty. This is important. This is definitely important. It's going to make the mistake. The mission Iranian was known revolution. As Ajax in the U.S. and Operation Boot in the U.K. But the principles were the same: protect Western oil interests in Iran. How? By overthrowing the democratically elected prime minister and installing a monarch more sympathetic to the U.S.'s and the U.K.'s demands. That's exactly what they did. The CIA even hired local mobsters to incite riots. What followed was the death and and subjugation of many of the Iranian people, and a period of unrest that would eventually lead to the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Number eight. Hmm. Went through that pretty quick. Yeah, so, you know, that region had been influenced and colonized, especially through, like, the World Wars for their oil, right? Uh, Britain and American oil interests really kind of took control of oil in Iran, and um, also pushed for more, like, like uh, cultural secularism in Iran. And Iranians felt that their, you know, country was being exploited. It was becoming imperialized. It was sympathizing with the West and moving towards Western culture and stuff like that. So you get this movement, this very much Islamic movement that was represented under uh, the Ayatollah that wanted to remove those interests, right? And um, that's what ends up happening with the with the revolution. So they overthrow the pro West leader, put in the Ayatollah, um, who is then going to basically found the uh, like today the Islamic Republic of Iran based on. Sharia principles and again Islamic culture and things like that. Um, it has also brought in a bitter uh, attitude towards the West and um, and the United States especially. So that's where some of the roots of that goes for. Okay, LBJ's micromanaging of the Vietnam War. Man, you can't put the Vietnam War on any president, but yeah. Lyndon B. Johnson's micromanaging of the presidents. Vietnam War. The year I even is Eisenhower through Nixon. The U.S. is in the midst of a brutal war in Vietnam, and their president has just been assassinated. In steps Lyndon B. Johnson, who, just two hours after the Kennedy assassination, assumes office. LBJ promptly takes the old adage, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself, and applies it to the Vietnam War, micromanaging it, and regularly ignoring advice from military advisors. It wasn't until Nixon became leader of the free world that those best suited for the job were handed the reins, effectively loosening the president's grip on the fight in Vietnam. Number seven. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Again, you got to put that on, you know, a lot of different presidents um, as well. Uh, United, uh, Vietnam is one of those examples of where where the original U.S. policy, which is to train people that support you, fails. What do you do next, right? So in a lot of those cases, the United States and who they supported won out. But like Vietnam, that does not work. The South Vietnam, the people that were against the communist movement, they fail. They're unable to do it. So the United States decides it was important enough to then put boots on the ground Americans in there. And even with that, of course, be, it ends up being you know a failure. If the goal was to prevent communism to spread into South Vietnam, then absolutely it was a failure. 
All right, uh, invasion of Iraq. Okay, this will be interesting. We'll see what take they're going to take. Um, probably one that said it's a bad decision because it was agreed upon by politicians that the justification for this war would be that Saddam Hussein and Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, which was never found. And I'm assuming that's what's going to be. And then maybe also talking about the destabilization of Iraq, where groups like ISIS and so many of the civil problems came in with the power vacuum that came with American intervention. George W. Bush invading Iraq in 2003. Whether you believe it was motivated by weapons of mass destruction, the 9 11 attacks, oil. or a need for oil, we can all That's agree that this 2003 attack on objection. the Middle East was divisive for the American people and devastating for the Iraqi. It kicked off a costly Millions eight died. plus year mm -hmm. Iraq war, which, rather than fighting terrorism, arguably fostered it, most notably giving rise to ISIS. On the home front, it turned America. Um, a group, by the way, because I don't want you to forget this, that ISIS that splintered off from Al Qaeda, which was also a group that was part of the Soviet Afghan war that the United States supported. See how it's all connected? ...into a nation divided, with one half of the population supporting the war and the other half vehemently against Man, it. That's In hard words, to deal with. Some were a little bit country and some were a little bit rock and roll. Shout out to South Park fans. Number six, uh, Austria Hungary decides necessary? to start a war. In Ooh, thank you. I did not know if a real mainstream like, you know, uh, content creator like Watch Mojo would do this. Okay, World War One is comp complicated. It's probably my favorite subject of modern history. Let's see what they got here. 14, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by Bosnian Serb nationalists. Austria-Hungary couldn't let the killing of their next ruler go lightly and decided right. to attack Serbia in retaliation. However, with Russia right. allied with Serbia, they wanted support from Germany in any conflict. By delaying their attack, Austria-Hungary ensured that Russia and its allies, France, and later the United Kingdom, entered the conflict as well. Right. All these events spiraled into the First World War. Granted, advances in military technology and the numerous European alliances ensured a massive conflict was bound to break out. But Austria-Hungary was the first to declare war. Number right. five. Although they would have said, oh, it's Serbia's fault, right? Because they didn't accept the ultimatum. Don't want to go into too much detail, but they actually took a, 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 a had a take here. I'm kind of interested or kind of impressed, I guess, in a way, because I kind of have that take, you know, for years and years and things of t teaching World War One and of course, learning about it and things like that. Uh, one of the, the things that people like do with World War One is is to um, place blame and where blame should be placed, you know, amongst all the countries. A lot of people like to say, you know, Germany um and for like escalating it or russia and stuff and not enough people i think are talking about austria hungary i'm on the side that the not even saying the majority but the highest percentage of blame should probably should should go to austria to austria hungary and not to get into it too deep but I'd actually be interested in what do you all um think about that i've done videos and polls actually if you go to my community tab i did one not long ago if you scroll down a little bit I actually did a poll with the community about uh, where percentages of blame for starting world war one should be Check that out. Russia invades Ukraine. Okay, so they're going, they're going very, I mean, this war is a year and a half old. We don't even know the effects of it yet. And they're putting this, they're putting number five, the worst decisions over the cause of World War I, fall of Napoleon, multiple things that ended the Soviet Union. No, this, this is what we call recency bias, okay? We still don't know the effects and the outcome yet. The denazification and demilitarization of Ukraine, that was his outrageous justification for all this. The first based on a lie, the second a euphemism. For Is that, did that make you think about how we were saying the United States trying to, uh, to, to justify the war in Iraq with oil? So if it's about denazification... Um, and if the Russians, you know, long term end up kind of losing this conflict, getting hurt, do you think that'll have a similar impression that it was started and will eventually be accepted as based on false pretenses, making this definitely seen as a um, as a, you know, a tragedy and or as a mistake? Maybe for invasion. Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. Despite Russian claims of Ukrainian Nazism, it was more likely to prevent Ukraine from joining NATO, regardless of the reasons. People love the to call people has Nazis. Been costly for both countries and the world economy. Tens of thousands have been killed on both sides. A refugee crisis has developed, not only in Ukraine, but also in Europe, as thousands seek to flee the draft. We are not afraid. We are 
ready to defend our country. Plus, countries worldwide have imposed sanctions on Russia, destroying Early. its economy. This Early. is an yeah. ongoing conflict, so the full extent of how bad a decision it is cannot be stated at this time. However, even the ramifications thus far are horrendous. This road lined with Russian tanks, destroyed when the Ukrainians were able to take this town back. Number four, Japan brings yeah, the United States. I think I said enough about that last one. I think that should be in a top five of the worst mistakes in history. All right, Japan, Japan brings the United States to World War II. Yeah. States into World War II. Not a good idea. While the fighting's confined to this area, as you can see, this is their road to Australia, and this is their way of controlling the sea lanes to America. During World War II, Japan had invaded China and Korea. This prompted harsh sanctions from the USA, Britain, and the Dutch, who had, had Korea, territory but... in the Pacific and or ties to China. This effectively robbed them of many necessary resources, including oil. Rather than lose face by withdrawing, Japan decided to declare war on the United States. United, or Japan's almost completely dependent on oil uh, from the United States. I don't know if I said that sentence right. You know what I mean? Um, to, to keep going with their imperial ambitions, uh, you know, that's that was the... To make a long story short, the reason they bomb Pearl Harbor, try to, you know, intimidate the Americans at opening um, trade back back up. But by the way, oil we should talk about as a reason for the military decisions of um, of Germany as well, going into places like Stalingrad. People don't understand that wars are resource wars. Attacking Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in 1941. This was a huge mistake. The USA retaliated with a costly and brutal war in the Pacific, leading to millions of deaths in the and only instance of nuclear weapons yeah, used in the warfare. The long-term effects on Japan were immense and still ripple through the country today. Look at them all. End of the Japanese Empire. Buchenwald. We, 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 we chewed them up. They just kept on coming. Number three. Say Buchenwald? Buchenwald was uh, yeah, a um, uh, concentration camp. Hitler invading Russia? Yep. Yep. Hitler yep, invading yep, yep, Russia. Um, I already told you, though, some of the reasons for that. I mean, of course, it's Liebenschraum, it's living space and all that stuff. But remember the uh, resources that are necessary. There's a quote that reads, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's exactly what the Nazis did in 1941. But, but she said, despite studying Napoleon's first invasion, everybody of learned from as reference. Napoleon's the Nazis mistake. attempted invasion of the Soviet Union resulted in a catastrophic loss of life. And in the eyes of many, it was the downfall of the Third Reich. Just like Napoleon, they planned on achieving a swift victory that never came. <laughs> Operation Barbarossa, as it would come to be known, yeah. lasted over five months and resulted in over five million deaths. Number two, angering well, Genghis Khan. For themselves, and the Russians had way more. 20 million Russians died um, defeating the Nazis. So, uh, angering Genghis Khan, all right. But you know, I'm really into Mongol history and, and Genghis Khan. Um, just learning about his crazy mind and outlook and motivations. But yeah, uh, you don't do this. There's a couple things in history you got to make sure that you remember, okay? You don't mess with the Mongols. If they offer you something, you take it. <laughs> and then don't invade Russia in the winter. So. Many angered the great Khan during his reign over the Mongol Empire, but none so spectacularly as the Alauddin Muhammad II, Shah of the Muslim Khwarazmian Empire. Yep. The result of infuriating the Khan meant the destruction of Alauddin's empire. But keep in mind that didn't have to be the case. Genghis wanted peace with the Shah, saying, yeah. quote, I am master of the lands of the rising sun, while you rule those of the setting sun. Let us conclude a firm treaty of friendship and peace. The Shah. So that's how the Mongols operate. Now, people, maybe they don't know or do know, whatever. Um, the Mongols like to avoid war in a lot of cases. They did. They were able to. I mean, they were so intimidating, of course, that their um, <coughs> story precedes them. Before you even inv get invaded, you know about the Mongol hordes, um, that you accept the deal. And, you know, sometimes they were it, basically the deal was going to be easier on you, the easier you were on the Mongols. The more you fought back against the Mongols, Either the worst the treaty is going to be, or whatever deal you make, or they just annihilate you, which is what happens here. Are refused, killing some Mongolian envoys. The result was, as previously stated, less than favorable for the Shah. It just goes to show, never mess with a Mongol. Before we... Yeah, they said no, so she breezed past. I'm sorry, I, I talk over things too much, but um, they actually killed the messenger, the Mongol messengers. Killed them. You don't do that. All right, what the heck is going on with uh, Ronald uh, 
McDonald here. All right. We continue. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest Rock. videos. You have the option to be notified oh, for occasional Wolfenstein. videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go the into your settings great and FPSs. switch on notifications. Number one, the victorious allies impose oh, harsh terms on Germany after World War One. This is a good pick. I mean, you could debate. It's, it'd be endlessly debatable to, to make this thing. But like, this is a legitimate thing that you could ar ar um, uh, argue for in bad decisions, bad decisions in history. Here we go. We got Wilson, Coleman So, David Lloyd George. These the guys. The Treaty of Versailles. The moment that would define the next half of the 20th century. The moment that would Still lead to the rise today. of fascism, the Nazis, and eventually the Holocaust. After a long and brutal World War I, the victorious allies were tasked with punishing the losers, and punish them they did. Well, and let's add too that these allies feel like the victims. They do not feel like the aggressors. So, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna attack somebody and you defeat them. You probably don't feel as motivated to put a, a big, you know, a lot of requirements in, in, a, in a treaty. But if you feel like you're the victim, right? If you're like France, who where so much of the fighting, you know, took place, you want revenge. You actually have revenge on the mind. And that's, that's a bad mindset to have to, to honestly be able to think clearly about how the future is going to be impacted. Most important factor of the treaty was that Germany had to take total and complete blame for the war, which meant they had to disarm and pay reparations to all affected countries. This would virtually bankrupt the European country and set the stage for a very sinister time in human history. Check out these other clips from Watch Mojo. <laughs> wow, they went through that pretty quick. Uh, yeah, the rise of fascism, right? The rise of fascism and as a scapegoat. Uh, the Nazi party, you know, comes in and basically is able to use the uh, the the Treaty of Versailles, you know, awful impact on Germany as a platform to gain, you know, seats in, in the new republic and um, to start to, you know, uh, be able to blame people. And that's where you're going to get scapegoats like they use with the Jews and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it very much directly led to World War Two. I mean, it really did. All right. Final thoughts. And I want your final thoughts. Put them down below. Okay, so when analyzing this list, try to think of it in two ways. One is, of course, look at it from Watch Mojo's perspective as they are going to, it's, it's a mainstream perspective. They're not historians, right? Um, and I think when you have that, that kind of bias, I don't know, what, whatever you would call that, um, you have to pick events that people know. I think you do. If this was full of a bunch of obscure events, I feel like the mainstream audience would, would have never have made it through this video. They would have been like, eh, I don't know what this is, boring, whatever, turn it off, right? So do you think from a mainstream perspective that this was a fair list? Um, from a historical perspective, I mean, you heard from me, there's a lot of things that should be shifted around. Um, I'm not going to go into what probably sh what else should be in here because some of the top things I, I do feel like we're in there because we could go endlessly. But... Um, yeah, so you could look at it from two ways, from the perspective of kind of the mainstream audience, but also from historians. So for, honestly, from a historian aspect, you're going to want to see things shifted around and, and moved and all that stuff. So um, in the comments specifically, what do you think they did right and what do you think they did wrong on this? Um, is there anything out here that should just be absolutely, do you think, called out and, you know, like aggressively addressed? Like if this became common knowledge, like me as a history teacher, what do you think I should be absolutely going after? You know what I mean? So um, I, I think too, my biggest thing to take away, because you're gonna wanna hear my impression, is there needed to be more um, earlier, I think stuff kind of going down in there. I mean, what the earliest they went back was probably the Crusades, you know, stuff like that. So, um, but there are a lot of decisions that of course were made, uh, you know, clear back in ancient times. That would definitely have, you know, could have could have changed things. What if what if the uh, um, what if like the 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 Persians had changed their policy um, towards their expansion into places like Greece, which will eventually come back to, you know, destroy them. The biggest superpower in ancient history, somewhere like that. Right. Uh, that's just like an example. A lot of stuff you could put in Roman history. You know, going to a republic or Julius Caesar coming in, you know, and 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 coming in and taking over. You've got that stuff. Um, but anyways, yeah, there's there's a, a a lot of things. And again, this was more about decisions, not just like world impacting events. 
So anyway, love to hear your thoughts on that and we can discuss it more because, you know, I just saw this. So I'm still putting my ideas together and get a conversation going over course in the Discord server as well. Also a great place to put videos um, to suggest. Anyways, with that, thanks again for joining me today and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.